freighter. I have been involved in the international freight forwarding field for a number of years. Today I would like to explain the services of the international freight forwarder and how they fit into your export program. Let me start with a bit of a definition. You may hear the term ocean transportation intermediary used from time to time. We come under the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, and a few years ago they decided to rename our industry, if you will, Ocean Transportation Intermediaries, OTI. They thought it did a better job of describing our role in the export program. So if I go back and forth between OTI and International Freight Forwarder, you'll know really I'm talking about the same industry. Uh, we are middlemen, you might say. We are, as I say, controlled and licensed by the Federal Maritime Commission. When you're exporting, you have a lot of firms, both public and private, uh, entities involved in the export process, and we bring a lot of them together. We minimize the involvement for you, the exporter. Uh, generally, I like to divide our services into three groups. Uh, preparing information, the uh, preparing documentation, and moving the shipment. On providing information, this can be very general information. You've already heard about ENCO terms uh, and, and how this affects your quoting when you're building your export price. The easiest way to put together your quote is by contacting an international freight forwarder, uh, be it going from XWorks all the way up to DDP, delivered duty paid. The freight forwarder can give you the charges that are necessary to come up with this bottom line figure. Other information that we can provide is sometimes of a very general nature, as an example. Perhaps you need to know the closest port that you can use. Let's say, uh, for safe, uh, sake of example, you have an inquiry uh, from someone in Stuttgart, Germany, and they want you to quote on your product CIF, cost insurance and freight, Hamburg. Perhaps you'll contact a freight forwarder and say, what port can I get out of going to Hamburg? Can I get out of the port of Wilmington? Do I go to Charleston, Norfolk? Do I have to go to New York or Miami? And to some areas of the world, you do indeed have to go to New York and Miami. So the freight forwarder can give you this information. Uh, general information such as containerization. Uh, containers are used for the vast majority of exports from the United States in this day and time. There are commodities due to their dimensions, due to their weight, due to the nature of the commodity that do not lend themselves to containerization. So you have a lot of alternatives when you export. You can go break bulk, you can go in containers. Containers come in various sizes. You can have a 20-foot long container, 40-foot long container, 45-foot long container, open tops, refrigerated units, all kinds of options. The freight forwarder can give you this information. Generally, the type container you would need is based on your commodity and perhaps on your consignee's needs. As an example, in many cases, you'll find that large pieces of equipment or machinery are easier to load and unload using an open top container. Basically, the roof comes off the container and it can be either a soft top or a hard top, a cap. But again, the freight forwarder has this information readily available. Uh, in, in setting up your quotes, he will need to know all of the details. They will need to know exactly the ports you'll be going in through, where your consignee is located, the value of the shipment, the exact commodity description, which is very, very important. And if it's a less than container load shipment, that is a shipment that's not going to justify the expense of using a 20-foot container, which is the smallest container available, they're going to need the measurements and the weight of each individual piece. Because in less than container load, known as LCL moves, you are charged on a weight or measurement basis in most all cases. In other words, a cubic meter or 1,000 kilos is going to be your freight ton. So it's very, very important that all of this information be available. Uh, other types of general information, uh, you, you would uh, export packing. It may well be that you're going to be using some wood in your, in your packing. And if you're using wood, be it a pallet, a wood crate, a wood box, or even bracing to brace your equipment into the container. In most cases, it's going to have to be treated wood, and it's going to have to be marked in accordance with ISPM 15. I would direct you to the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, APHIS, their website. You will find a tremendous amount of information. As a matter of fact, you can plug in the country of destination, and it will give you all of the requirements for that particular country. This is very, very important because what can happen if you happen to ship 
on, con on pallets as an example or use bracing in the container that is not treated and marked. And I emphasize and marked because simply being treated is not enough. Then you will, uh, your constantly will incur additional expenses. At the very least, they're probably going to have to have the container or the shipment fumigated, which is very expensive and it's a delay. And you know, the bottom line is you want to have repeat sales to that customer. You do not want an unhappy customer. And depending on your terms of sale, you may in fact be incurring those expenses for your account. If you're selling DDP, if you're selling DDU, you may well be incurring these expenses for your account. But in any case, at the end of the day, you want a happy customer. Uh, so again, this is another type of information that's available from the International Freight Folder. Uh, we have accounts that, quite frankly, are very, very knowledgeable. They do their own bookings with the lines. They do most of their own documentation. They rely on us primarily to transmit the export control data and perhaps to prepare the ocean bill of lading. On the other hand, we have accounts that will ship us, uh, you know, a stack of documents like this with a rubber band around it and say, see what you can make of this. Uh, most of our accounts are someplace in the middle. But the freight forwarder, and at the end of my presentation, I would like to take a few minutes to talk about how to select a freight forwarder or some suggestions on how to uh, select a freight forwarder. Uh, basically, you select someone that tailors their services to your needs, and I think that's the most important thing to consider. The next area that we'll talk about would be preparing the documentation. And this is an area where a lot of people throw up their hands and say, oh, this is beyond me. It is really not that difficult. Uh, quite frankly, over the past few years, documentation has become much, much simpler than it was in past years. We no longer have all the various consular documents that we had in years past. Uh, we have generally uh, general certificates of origin. The forms that are required today are much less than it was in the past. Let's talk about the types of documents that you have. First off, you have the documentation required to clear the United States. In other words, to satisfy the United States government. This basically is done electronically in this day and time. Years past, we had what was known as the 7525V, or the Canary Yellow Form, some of you might recall, uh, that we actually physically submitted before the shipment moved, or actually in the early days, up to five or six days after the shipment moved. In this day and time, this is all done through the uh, automated uh, export system.